consultant focused on tourism, sustainable innovation and ideas. And this series is all about connecting with people around Japan who are doing interesting things with a lens on sustainability. Today we have one of our very popular topics about Akia, abandoned homes in Japan and how to remodel and reform them to make them into beautiful homes. And we have today F Jeremy Phillips with us. Thank you so much for joining, Jeremy. Hello, hello. So Thank Jeremy, you. you are a historian, are you? Yes, I've uh, got a doctorate in Japanese history uh, a few years back and uh, now I uh, teach a few classes at the uh, local national university. And you're also a translator? Is that right? Yes, uh, I do a lot of translation work. For the bulk, my bulk of my uh, work is actually that, really, income wise, at least. Yeah, and uh, then also you're doing historic Japanese history walking tours around Kanazawa. Is that right? Yes, I was asked uh, well, a few years now, ago. Now, this actually started when I was working on a sort of blog with another professor at another university in the city about how to use historical resources for tourism purposes and I sort of wrote up a blog of introducing some parts of Kanazawa and I got an email from this this American guy who set up a, a company for tours of the city and they like to give tours led by specialists like if you want if you're like if you're into architecture they have an architect show you around if you're into art they'll have an artist show you around and as a sort of sort of historian they've thought I might be a nice person to show people around who want like a history-based uh, walking tour. So I've been doing that for uh, a few years now. Well, not actually this year or last year for obvious reasons, but uh, I actually enjoy doing them because it's a, it's a way to, uh, when, when you're teaching history to, to, or talking about history with Japanese people, they all, always have this knowledge of history that you, you get just by osmosis really just by living in the country but for you know for foreign visitors westerners and so on they come in and they know nothing so i get to talk about everything from the ground up yeah that'd be really interesting i i really like that approach using uh content specific tour guides who have like a deep knowledge of different areas because especially areas like kanazawa you must have so many interesting places because of history and the normal tourist coming inbound who can't read all of the Japanese, it would be a high hurdle for them to understand a lot of this history, I imagine. What, what I think is important with the way I approach it is you, your standard tour guide will take you to the castle, the park, and they'll say this was built in whatever year by whatever lord. And I think for most people, that goes in one unit, out the other. But what I try to provide is more background. Like if you go to the, the samurai district, why do these houses look like this? Why are they here? Why are they built like this? Why does the area, uh, why does this part of the city still have these houses and other parts don't? And what's the unique features of this sort of house compared to like a merchant house? So I try to provide that sort of a deeper uh, look into it. And also, of course, uh, because of the studies I've done, I can point out some aspects of uh, just walking around that other people might not even notice. Like, this is where the old moat used to be, sort of thing. Uh, this is where the uh, old uh, downtown area used to be. This is where the uh, lords would travel out to Edward and back every uh, other year. So I can sort of provide that background uh, knowledge, which I think makes the experience a whole lot richer when you uh, come and see it rather than just, you know, Lord, what's his name, build that, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think so. And there's so many similar types of looking things around Japan when people are visiting and travel around. Oh, there's a shrine. Oh, there's yes. a temple. Like, they all kind of look the same to yes. visitors, yes. right? But if you know the individual stories, like uh, we also, in the series, we talk to Matt Alt and Hiroko Yoda, and they write a series of books about yokai and folk tales. And uh -huh. they often went to different shrines or studied Japanese history because it was connected to these mm -hmm. folk tales. And that just makes it so much more interesting 
when you're visiting different places, right? Yes, yes. When you, when you get that sort of extra layer of uh, knowledge down there. Yeah. So Definitely. when you're remodeling your house, did you mm. notice a lot of things about historical building designs or the beautiful old beams with the odd shapes? We've talked about that with Japanese carpenters and Japanese architects. And that that's such a treat to find in your house, right? Oh, yes. I mean, one of my criteria for getting a, uh, a farmhouse was it would have these lovely huge old beams if i just tilt the screen up you can see i think actually, can you see them yeah uh, and i've got a photo here as well i can show right so yeah i think the lights are a bit stronger we'll take it closer look later on yeah well, well uh, you're gonna take us around the house on a little tour later on right um i'm showing the yeah. view from the outside it yeah, looks like yeah. just a stunning location your house and surrounded by rice fields or agriculture? Right. Was it wheat and then you've got the mountains behind? Yeah, so one side we've got uh, wheat fields and they're a nice golden color now. And then there's rice. I'm looking directly out the front doors and I'm looking over rice paddies over the valley. And behind me, I've got uh, the uh, mountain hill, big ski area there too. So I mean, I should bring my skis up again next yeah. next winter. Are you a skier? Does it make you want to go out and hit the slopes all the time? Well, at the at university, I was in the ski circle. So, yes, I mean, I haven't been skiing for quite a few years now because um, so I haven't really got around to it. But I timed from my from the, in front of my house to the ski areas uh, four and a half minutes. So it would be a bit of a waste not to use it. Your your videos showing you doing all these DIY projects is really impressive. Um, you told me before we started that you've been learning a lot just watching YouTube and getting some advice from friends. Is that right? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I mean, I know my way around saws and hammers and stuff because I, my, you know, my father had tools and home, and I would sometimes use those, and he would sometimes do some work on the house and so on, but nothing on a large scale. But I mean, but, but I mean, I know, and of course, Western saws and Japanese saws are quite different with the Western saws you push with Japanese saws you pull, ditto planes and push and pull, it's quite different. Yeah. But I mean, the basic concept is the same. And I, I saw mm -hmm. that you were using like uh, more natural stains on the wood um, you're taking down some of the plaster. So are, is your concept to kind of restore a more traditional look inside? Yes, I, I, I want to take it as uh, close to what, it, well, not actually absolutely what it was back when it was first built because uh, there'll be, the, the main entrance hall would have been uh, earth or concrete. I don't quite want to go that far because otherwise I'd be taking my shoes off and putting them on all the time. But in terms of the styles of the main rooms, I do want to take them as far as possible back to what they were originally. In this room, it hasn't changed, but there are some other rooms where I mean, the people that lived here before, how many, how many decades ago, just cover the walls up, put in false ceilings that you would never guess what is behind them and so I sort of poked a hole in the ceiling and took a look up with a torch and saw these wonderful beams and I thought okay well that's coming down yeah it looks like the front hall picture that I'm showing right now has just gorgeous wood flooring and wood beams and is it bamboo in the top as well in the front yeah, which, hall area? are you showing the room with the uh, white walls or with the dark brown or the brown walls uh, it has white plaster in between All right, the wood this, beams. This one here. Uh -huh. Yeah. This is this is what's called the uh, the oet, the the hiroma, the main room. Okay. And uh, it would originally have had bamboo up at the up at the top. It would have been a uh, bamboo laid across to let smoke and stuff out. But uh, one of the interesting things about this particular house is that back in I think '94. 
apparently, according to the uh, relatives of the people of the family that used to live here, every time they got in a, a bride, every time a bride came into the family, they would fix up part of the house. And in 1994, they actually put, they turned the attic into a second living area, living floor. There's three big rooms up there. And so that means that the uh, the bamboo ceiling that would have been up there has been replaced with uh, boards and stuff. So it's essentially the same coloration as bamboo. It's, it's brown, so I'm not going to really do much about it. Yeah. No. And a yeah. really nice feature uh, is the irori, the in indoor yeah. cooking area, yes. right? Yes, the hearth in the middle of the room, which the is... The hearth, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, about that, can you see the? Yeah, I can see the, the fish and the hanging. Yeah. This is the, 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 the big uh, wooden. Uh, it looks really heavy, that, what do you call it, the, the what you're holding? The, the, whole, the whole setup is... is well, particularly in this part here, you know, the, the jizai kagi, the adjustable hook, you can uh, make it higher or lower. Change, mm -hmm. yeah, make the uh, pot higher or lower. Uh, my, I haven't made actually, I have not actually touched this, so I haven't fiddled with this at all because it's very much a, a later on thing. Yeah, I don't need to do anything about that at the moment. I and you said okay. that's why the ceiling is bamboo, so the smoke can go through. Is that right? So the smoke uh, sort of trickle up through the uh, roof, yes. A lot of ha traditional houses would have had bamboo ceilings like that just laid on. Mm -hmm. uh, when they've been up there for a few decades or so, they turn this lovely dark black color. <laughs> and I, I've been uh, in one, I think it was a guest house that had an irori. Um, and when mm -hmm. they were using it, the whole room was so smoky. And I thought, oh, it's a beautiful concept, but if you don't have a chimney, so you, you haven't fired it up yet, so you don't know if it's going to work or not, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to use, when I do use it, I'm going to use charcoal, okay. not wood. Okay. Charcoal should, should theoretically not put out too much smoke. Yeah. And when I do use it, I'll, I'll have the, the doors and all that open. But I have been in a, a friend's house up in the Nolta Peninsula, and they had an, they've got an erodi, and... They had it on, and there was yeah, no smoke, no smoke to speak of. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I think it'll work. Good, good, good. I I also noticed you've got a really beautiful little. Is it a tea area? Uh, what do you call that? Is it a tokonoma? Uh, in one of the. On the next side room. Rooms. Yes. Are you you gonna keep that? Kind of as is, so you. It looks like a beautiful, beautifully done area. Oh yeah. So if you mean the uh, the tokonoma in the room next door, I'm going to keep all that. The only things I want to do with the uh, the two the zaski rooms, the, the the reception rooms next door, is replace the tatami mats. They don't have. They're not all there, and uh, recolor the walls because they're the sort of shade of green that I don't like. I saw the green. It looks very 70s, 80s, maybe. I, I kind of like it in a way because it's so retro. But I, I think I saw a CGI version of mm -hmm. your your building. Did you do that? Is that a yes. computer generated? Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you're able to kind of uh, put your vision kind of into a visual form. How are you doing that? Can you walk us through that? I'm using a free software called Blender, as in a food mixer Blender, and uh, it's a bit of a steep learning curve, and I'm really only dabbling in it. Uh, when I first checked this place out, there was no floor plan available. So one of my first priorities was to figure out how all the rooms fitted together in relation to each other, and so that I basically measured things out and drew them did a mock-up in the computer and I'm sort of working on refining that. And it's also a way to work out uh, sort of color schemes. And so what I want to do with those two reception rooms is the one with the tokonoma, I want to have the walls red because that's a traditional uh, color 
up in, in Kanaza, Bengara, is used for walls in some high class establishments, uh, like in the Geisha district, for example. And the other one I want to have as uh, blue, which is also a traditional uh, Kanaza color for interior decoration. If you go to the uh, Seisankaku Villa next to Kenokwe, and it was a villa built in the 1860s for the mother of the ruling lord, upstairs the room there has got walls with uh, purple and black and red and blue. And so it's quite dramatic. It's quite unlike anything you might think of sort of traditional Japanese design based on like Kyoto style or tea rooms and so on. So, I mean, it's, it's bright, it's bold, but it is very authentically uh, traditional Japanese coloration. Yeah, I love your annotated uh, pictures. You've got a few of them. Um, I love the view of the house with all the rooms and you can see your your kind of vision for how you want every room to look. Uh, it's amazing. Right. It's really the, cool software. Oh, well, it renders, uh, well, it's free, so it's worth the money, but it's, it's certainly a good way to uh, plan these things out. And another thing you can do is to take photos of the rooms and then put into a, like a photo editing software and just recolor the walls and stuff to see what color would look nice. And that's what I did, for example, with the back passage. I took a photo of that and I changed the color of the walls, about six or seven different shades before I selected the, uh, the blue that I have currently used. That's really interesting and very cool technology. Uh, one of the rooms, the main room with the irori, around the irori, and I saw that you had one with tatami and one with hardwood floors. And I was like, before I realized it was computer generated, I was thinking, oh my gosh, did he do the tatami and then take it out and put floor again? Like how expensive <laughs> that must have, must have been. It's no, really that, uh, realistic looking. <laughs> yes, the, the, the program can do impressive things, but that was when I was, I initially wanted to have hardwood floors in this main room because it's a couple of old houses I've seen in museums that have hardwood floors around the irori in the main room. But I've also visited a few of the neighbors who have very similar style houses and they've all got tatami mats in their main room. And apparently that's what was actually used if you if you could. And so I'm gonna put, that's, so I did mock up in Blender of one version with hardwood floors, one version with tatami. And I think the tatami just looks so much warmer and brighter, lighter inside. And so a bit that. more like comforting instead of yes, yeah. it's a place you can sort of relax on. And yeah. hardwood floor here would get cold in winter. Yeah, well, tell me a little bit about the surrounding area because the scenery just looks beautiful. And one mm -hmm. of your videos was just cracking me up. You're you're playing Flight of the Bumblebee as you're driving through oh <laughs> up to the house, and it's like building the tension as you're driving. I thought that was hilarious. You uh, have to I put think... together a book or something. This is great documentation. <laughs> well, that was one of the, um, I don't want YouTube to frag my videos for copyright infringement. So that was one of the free uh, music clips that they let you use. And I, th I think it was um, Hall of the Mountain Kink from memory. But yeah, so I was, I was quite limited in the music I, I could choose. <laughs> but yes, it's, uh, it's, Quite surprising, really. It's a very rural area. The nearest convenience store is like a 10 minute drive away. I don't think there's a single vending machine in the village. So, I mean, it's, it's rural. It's just gorgeous. Like the natural forest, you can see the diverse trees in the forest. So mm. it's all different colors in autumn. Uh, you've got the view recently, maybe, where the, the rice field is planted, I showed earlier. It's just gorgeous. Uh, Louise Puppy has joined from Auckland, New Zealand, uh, the travel agent I told you about. So it's great to have you here, Louise, fellow Aucklander. Do you call yourselves Aucklanders? No? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, okay. Great. Um, yeah, so it it's a drive maybe from you where you were living before. Are you now moved in and working on it? It's, it's got a while to go before that. Um, I do have power and water but I don't have uh, gas, so there's no hot water. And what I'm going to have to do is to, uh, well, the city wants you to 
if you have a sewage a septic tank the city really wants you to connect up to the sewer system and there's actually space upstairs for a, a toilet and a sink and they have got plumbing in there but the plumbing goes out on the on the back of the house and i think it, they just put out the the nearest possible wall and i so i can't use i can't put a toilet out there because it's just going to uh, dump everything in the garden so i'm gonna have to get those re rerouted and all the plumbing uh get it up to the sewer that's going to be a that's going to be a big project it's going to be one of the one of the big uh expensive projects but it's, it's going to have to get done yeah and I mean, the the septic tank is not in good condition and the yeah. right now the kitchen water and all that they get drained straight out into the into the gutters so it's, it's not ideal yeah there is and, there is a small garden outside with a beautiful red momiji tree as well um yes are you planning to do any work outside like gardening or growing food oh yes i definitely well i want to get the sort of interior of the house done a bit so i can sort of spend time in the house and then go out and do a bit of gardening and then come in and sort of rest a bit uh, the land area is actually i think it's something it's nearly 900 square meters wow it's quite a big quite property big although in this area it's one of the smaller properties there's some there's some large estate or large land large sections out here but uh you know, so it's, it's Almost it's nearly as big as the house I grew up in in Auckland in terms of land area. Nice. But that's the lovely Which... thing about the old houses sometimes. Like we, we bought an old house too. And one of the things I really like is the first floor and the second floor are the same size. A lot of the mm. more modern houses get smaller on the second floor, maybe due to stability issues. Um, but it looks like you've got loads of space inside as well. Gorgeous. Oh, yeah. The house area in total is like 336 square meters, which is like 36,000 square, no, no, 3,600 square feet. Wow. Are you going to rent a guest house or is it just all for you? <laughs> uh, well, by the time I finish moving my wife's things across, it's going to be filled up. Yeah, yeah. Because she has got so many things. And what, I'm also, yeah, you found some treasures inside too. I, I love seeing like an old desk. Uh, you found some lacquerware, uh, old uh, lantern, things like that. Anything that surprised you? When I, uh, the sellers said they were going to get rid of all the stuff in, in the house and I could, I was welcome to come over and uh, put aside anything I wanted to keep. So I was able to sort of put aside a few of the uh, good things. And the second floor of the storehouse, the other storehouse, I said, basically, don't touch anything there because you've got these lovely old chests and stuff. And there's probably some good stuff in there. Turned out not really. And the chests are largely empty or full of old futons. But there's some lovely lacquerware up there, like sets of sets of old lacquerware. So I'm glad I could keep those. But actually, most of the stuff you see here, like this, this screen here, has actually been brought across my wife's parents' place. Because they also have a very old house. It's that uh, built in like Meiji 11, like 19th century house, and it's in bad condition. So I'm trying to move as much of the good stuff here so we can do some work on that as well, which is going to require probably professionals because it's it's not in good shape. Yeah. But, I, but to do that, I need to clean it out first. And so I'm moving some good stuff, stuff worth keeping over to this house. I've got the room for it here. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Is... Uh, I love how you're you're keeping some of the features. You've got an old rusted kind of harness of some sort. It's about the back. I, I don't know what it is. It's like, like a bear trap or maybe old snowshoes or something. But... Yeah, it's a mystery. But somebody, mm. maybe somebody watching knows what it is. If you know what it is, please comment below. Um, I'm but not yeah, sure that, interesting things. Uh, I, I like that sort of uh, just those sort of rusty things hanging around. Yeah. And uh, you've also, oh, you got rid of the plastering and you had to rent like a plaster recycle skip or something. That was interesting. 
Yes, there's a, a lot of uh, plasterboard that I had to tear down to reveal the uh, original wall behind it. And you can't take plasterboard out to the local dump and just throw it away. It's, it requires special treatment. And so I phoned around a couple of places, and there's one place that would rent me a skiff for like 55,000 yen, which is not cheap. But plasterboard is expensive to get rid of. I knew that. I mean, and uh, so I managed, I did my very best to make sure I could get as much of the plasterboard in as possible and layering it carefully flat. And I actually have room left over. Good, good. So, so all went in. speaking of cost, could you give us a ballpark for how much the house was, how much you're budgeting for remodel? Well, the house, uh, people like to think about Japan as being an expensive place to live with expensive houses. And they look at Tokyo and they maybe they heard stories from the bubble era when people were saying the Imperial Palace is worth roughly California. And those days are long gone. And outside Tokyo, outside the big cities, outside any city really, prices just go like that. I bought a house that doesn't leak on 900 square meters of land with a garage, with a storehouse, with beam work that would cost millions to do today, 3 million yen, less than 30,000 US. That's amazing. Insane. It's ins and this is not even one of the cheaper ones. You can get cheaper houses in Japan. And, but and I can get from here, downtown Kanazawa in half an hour. Wow. So it's can, it's not that inconvenient either, the location. It, it used to be very inconvenient. I think that's one of the things. Before the, the road was widened over to the, the city, it was quite a narrow, twisty road in order to take about twice as long. But now it's, I can get to the university in 20 minutes. Wow. That's, it's, and that's, it's 5 million, I'm no, sorry, 3 million yen for the houses. Like, why don't more people come out here and buy houses for this price? That I don't know. Amazing. That is really a great bargain. And how much are you budgeting for the remodel? Do you have a budget in mind? No, not really. I, I don't, I, I literally don't know what things are going to cost. I would prefer not to spend more than the house cost. Yeah. So uh, ideally, I would want to keep everything under six million total. That would be a great bargain, wouldn't it? Would be, yeah. 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 Amazing. Same, especially, I mean, if uh, the Auckland guide is still there, I mean, she'll be able to tell you that house prices in Auckland are insane. Yeah. Median house price in Auckland is now over one million New Zealand dollars. Oh my God. That's crazy. It's like Hawaii. I grew up in Hawaii and ah. yeah, real estate is nuts. Um, that is such a great bargain. And of course, such a high quality of life once you buy it and remodel and start living in it and enjoying where you are. Uh, Louise says, yes, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, some of the interesting traditional Japanese home things, like the mud walls, is mm -hmm. interesting to see how you're managing that. So are you trying to keep it like with the traditional style, traditional technique as much as possible? And or are you changing to more modern styles? What's what's your strategy for that? Well, there's so far, there's two main rooms that have got mud walls in them that have been exposed. One of them is the uh, entrance hall, and the other is the kitchen. I think the kitchen needs a covering because I don't really want to mud walls in the kitchen. So I'm going to seal those, repair the cracks and so on, and then seal them up, seal, and then I'm going to plaster over that. But in the entrance hall, I want to keep the earth walls as much as possible. So I'm going to uh, try and repair them. You can buy uh, sets of uh, you know, mud <laughs> mixed with straw that you basically just mix with water and uh, you can use those to repair uh, mud walls, I believe. I've not actually got around to trying that yet. Um, if I was going to be very fancy, what I would do is knock down the mud walls, collect the mud, remix it and reapply it. But that would be a big operation and I think a little bit beyond my pay grade. Yeah. 
But I'll, so I'll see what I can. I think you did that in one section. You said you took some of the pieces that fell down, you tried to mix it with water and put it back yeah. up. That's what I'm showing now. But you also right. did some beautiful plastering using like a, a blue plaster. In right, the, yes, that's yeah. in the back passage. Mm, gorgeous. Uh, instead of going, with, I was going to go with a, uh, a light blue. That's where I did my uh, different, you know, sort of, sort of photoshopping different colors on it to see what looked nicer. And I thought the light blue worked well with the, the reddish wood and because it's open to the outside with the sliding doors and so on. But instead of going just a plain blue, I mixed in a bit of white as well to give it a sort of sort of cloudy sky effect. Well, it was my first time plastering, so it's not as smooth as it could be, but this, I'll call that texture. Yeah. I'll, I'll pretend it was deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> plastering but, was one of the things that I managed to do uh, in terms of DIY remodeling our place. And I really enjoyed it, you know, if using natural plaster, if you kind of mess up, it's not really messing up because it gives texture and it looks nice, right? <laughs> I, I yes, love yes. it. You've done a great job. Yeah, well done. Yes, although I did all that in one day and I think that was a bit too ambitious because by the end of it, I was going, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard when you're, it really is an arm workout. Have you noticed some muscles popping up from all your hard work? <laughs> I've noticed a, getting a, a, a sore right hand from all the uh, hammering and sawing and all that. But what a, what a great story, though, when it's finished to be able to show your guests around and say all the work that you've done. In fact, I think it's time for you to walk us around and show us some of what you've done. Right, okay. I'll uh, unplug this. There should be enough battery in here. Right. Okay, you got a glaring light there. I think a good place to start would be well, the rain has actually eased up. So let's just head outside to give you a view of the front of the house. You've done a great job uh, putting stain and restoring some of the wood color. It looks right. gorgeous in there. Mm. We're going to start outside. Great. Yeah. This particular style of house is known as Azimadachi, which means east facing. Out in this part of the country, the prevailing winds are from the uh, south and west, so the houses are traditionally built facing east to avoid the worst of the weather. And they would come, they would be traditionally surrounded on the uh, windy sides by uh, trees, sort of uh, windbreak trees, known locally as Kainyo, which is for in more normal Japanese, standard Japanese, yashiki bayashi. Kainyo is the local uh, dialect for it. And one of the things I was glad to see that this house still had, it still had some of the mature trees. A lot of the houses, a lot of the open, empty houses that are put up for sale have those trees cut down because I presume there's some misguided belief that buyers don't want to deal with big trees. But I, I'm so I'm very glad that You'll see them around the back, but you can't see them from here. Yeah, I noticed but, that. Two beautiful trees right next to the, the house. It's so unusual. Right at the, yeah, at the back, yes. There's actually three uh, mature trees. Oh, wow. It's, so the, one of the features of the Azimadachi style is the uh, big gabled roof, big front-facing gable. And that was one of the uh, things I wanted to be uh, a bit insistent on. I wanted to have this uh, traditional big gable. Gorgeous. But one of the prevailing theories about how this house style developed is that it was inspired by samurai houses. And the late uh, Edo period, early Meiji period, wealthy farmers started copying the styles of the samurai. And it is very, very similar. Yeah. yeah. And it, you, you showed a picture during winter. So even in winter? It wasn't that cold inside? Was it cold? Yes, uh, the only time, I've, well, I've actually, most of the time I've been in the house in winter, I've been working hard, <laughs> so I've been keeping warm. But uh, it does get cold in winter, but it doesn't get, it seldom drops far below freezing. It's, it's going to be cold, but it's not going to be bearable. Warm coats and thick slippers. <laughs> 
that sort of thing. Yeah. What it does get is it gets a lot of snow. And you're adding insulation as well, which should help, right? Yes, I'm going to, I'm adding insulation where I can, but I'm, I'm not going to be as uh, fast about If it's a choice between insulation and having a, a good looking ceiling, I'm going to go for the good looking ceiling. Yeah. Uh, one of the people in the series was actually adding sheep's wool um, from New Zealand. So maybe you could ask your ask Louise or ask your friends to send some over. <laughs> well, actually, uh, my father, my father's used some of that as well in his, his, his house in New Zealand. It's apparently a very good. One of the uh, another feature of this style of house has got actually got two front doors. We have the uh, normal front door there, and then there's a these open up. These are for guests, apparently. Wow. This would be shown to this uh, wider front door. And so they could come in directly into the main room. I love that Engawa system. That certainly helps mm. with the cold and the heat. But on a nice breezy day, you can open everything up, right? It's fantastic. Yeah, it's Yes, I don't want to have to put air conditioners in every single room, so I'm hoping to get some nice breezes. Japanese houses have always been traditionally, oh, one of the neighbors, Japanese houses have always been traditionally designed for summer, not winter. Let the uh, breezes go through. You do get quite a few breezes out here. It's quite a windy area. Yeah, we, this, we have a question from Selena Hoy. Uh, Thanks, Selena. She says, is the function of the Engawa for insulation? It's kind of a social function as well, right? The public part of the house for greeting guests. Yes, uh, this sort of uh, thing here you can see. But this would be where uh, you take your shoes off and so you can get up on there. This house doesn't have it, but a lot of houses of the similar style will actually have a Ingo um, area, which is like this, half inside it, half half earth or concrete, mm -hmm. which will be used traditionally for doing uh, work that required, that couldn't be done inside, but needed to be undercover like when it was raining and so on. Right, right. So it's, it's, it's a good place for doing some uh, um, construction work or whatever that you don't want to do inside, but you can't do outside because it's wet. Would, and, that, would that also be somewhere that like kids would play in the house if it was rainy or bad weather? in the olden days, perhaps? I I would not think so, no. In yeah. most cases, it would not be large enough. Right. <laughs> Maybe small small children. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've not actually ever heard of children playing in uh, Inga as a, as a um, habit. Maybe so, as a custom. outside, stay outside, right? Uh, yeah, get the kids outside, yeah. Not so worried about the rain back in those days. So what projects are you working on right now? Are you doing more wood, like staining and preserving the wood or walls? Right now, there's the two areas that I'm working on. Uh, this is the entrance hall. That There used to be a, a room. You can still see, you can see, make out the where the wall used to be. Uh-huh. And so with a friend's help, we tore that wall down, tore the false ceiling down to expose these original beams. Look at those. Lovely. Gorgeous. Beam workers, like four meters high. Yeah. 